By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And it is Friday and that means we have magic for you from the Raging Bull series. And we have now reached the top eight. Now something special happened in the top eight. We couldn't get the start of the match. So that's why you're seeing this freeze frame in the back. Fortunately, we only missed like the first turn of game one. So we still have the rest for you. So don't worry. Uh, I can fill you into what happened. And this match is between uh, Brother Stebo from the Brothers of Fire in England against um, Juan Lopez from Spain. And um, I believe Barcelona, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and they are going to battle it out to see who's going to make it to the semifinals. And I believe Brother Stebo is on an ATOC deck and he's battling against Juan that we've seen actually before here. There's probably a, a card popping up right now linking to that exact match here from the Raging Bull series. And he's on his pink weenie brew. And now before we go to the actual games, we are first going to do a little bit of deck tech. I've got deck pictures of both of these decks. Now if you want to go straight to the games themselves, no worries. Check the description below. There you will find a timestamp. Click on the timestamp. And that will take you straight to game number one. And for here, we are going to continue by looking at the deck of Brother Stebo, the Atok of Brew. And here we see the deck of Brother Stebo. So this is the Atok build. And I think interesting here is when when I first see like Surrender Pafrits and Lightning Bolts, I still think of Counter Burn, but I guess Counter Burn is kind of passe. We see the Atok Brews really taking over that department of the decks. And um, I just want to point out here that there are beautiful places of summer. Atox and of uh, Summer Shedders there. Not a full playset in the deck, but three of them. And um, interesting to see, for example, that he's chosen to go with Shedder instead of Energy Flux. I actually like this because I think Energy Flux is definitely better against certain decks, but Shedder just gets the job done. It's instant speed. Uh, it does what you want to do. And uh, talking about instants, there are a lot of instants in this deck. You've got the Lightning Bolts, of course. Um, you have the Ancestral Recall. Of course, we've got all the, all the power cards in this deck. Uh, we've got only two Psionic Blasts, so that's quite interesting. Usually you see people playing with three and sometimes four in these type of decks. And we also see two white cards included, the Armageddon and the Balance. And I think Armageddon is a very good inclusion here because you don't need a lot of mana uh, to cast your, your Chain Lightnings, Lightning Bolts and all of that. You don't need a lot of mana to cast your Surrender Pafrit and your Atok. And besides, Armageddon only deals with the lands, so you're still going to keep your artifact mana. And besides, he's also playing with two Ank of Mishra. So I think this Armageddon could actually be decisive in some of the games. It's going to be interesting. Um, also interesting to see the Pink Weenie deck, because actually the Pink Weenie deck that Brother Stebo is playing against doesn't really mind an Armageddon, doesn't need a lot of mana uh, as well. So that tactic might not work as well as, uh, as Brother Stebo might hope against this particular opponent. Um, and also when we, when we look at it, I just see a lot of... You know, the regular customers in this deck. Obviously, we've got the two black cards, Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. Um, you know, this just that, that can be very brutal. We see on the sideboard, we see the three Glooms. So they could be quite uh, important in this matchup since uh, Juan is playing with a lot of white with that pink Weenie Brew. So this is the deck of Brother Stebo. Looks very strong, very quick, very aggro. And he's going to take on Juan, who's also having a very aggro strategy. So it could be quite interesting to see the games. But before we do that, let's first go and take a look at the deck of Juan. And here we see the deck of Juan. So this is the white, red deck, pink weenie. So of course it means it's a quick deck. You see a lot of low casting cost uh, spells and creatures. I think the card with the highest casting cost here is um, Blood Moon and Wheel of Fortune with the casting cost of three. And of course, the Grand Gar Gargoyles as well have the similar casting cost. Now, we've discussed this deck before, and I think what's still relevant here is that Juan really co chose for consistency. So he's going with Braskal Orc, that's one red and one instead of White Knight, which is two white. So it's a bit harder to cast the White Knight. So that's probably why he chose the Orc. Then also he's chosen to go with the uh, four granite gargoyles, one red and two, instead of the thunder spirit, which is two white and one. So he really kind of chose more of the direction of red because it's easier to cast it with only that you know single color in the casting cost. Um, another thing here, we see four disenchants, and I think they're going to play a very big role against, of course, the Atok deck, which is filled chock full 
of artifacts and I wonder if after sideboarding he's maybe going to put in those three divine offerings having seven ways to deal with artifacts now remember uh, a brother Stebo also has those glooms in his sideboard so he can also decide to put those glooms in which he probably will and therefore uh, Juan will probably need to reserve a few of his disenchants for those glooms so it's going to be you know, quite interesting to see how this match is going. Both players are playing with a full play set of bolts, a full play set of chains. So I think maybe this game can go really, really quick. But maybe both players can kind of stall out and it can be a very long, like kind of top decking mode game. That's also a possibility here. I, I do believe we're going to see very explosive and quick games. But like I said, sometimes you just run out of steam, your opponent runs out of steam, uh, you know, you've got no cards in hand in what, turn four or something, and you're just top decking, waiting to see who who, get, who finds that final chain or, or lightning bolts. That, that's definitely a scenario that wouldn't surprise me. And um, talking about the sideboard, because I just talked about the Divine Offerings, we do see four red elemental blasts, so that's going to be interesting, because he can, of course, take care of the blue chunk of the deck of Brother Stebo, but also he has that city in a bottle against the Surrendip Afrit. So he's got some, some weapons against the Surrendip. So I think it's going to be hard for the Surrendips to see a lot of action in this particular matchup. And um, I also wonder if maybe uh, because Brother Stebo is playing with the Atox, if perhaps um, uh, if, if perhaps Juan is going to choose to put the Spirit Links in and maybe he's going to choose to put some Sarah Angels in because, of course, they have, uh, they uh, they fly over the Atok and uh, they win a battle against uh, the Surrounded Pafrit. So that, there are going to be some interesting sideboard moves here for both players to make. Uh, so this is the deck of Juan. He's going to take on the Atok Proof Brother Stebo. Let's go to the games. Game number one here of the top eight of the Raging Bull series. We've got Brother Stebo sitting on the left. We've got Juan from Spain sitting on the right. And as we can see, We've missed turn number one, the first turn completely. Uh, and I can kind of talk you through this. What happened is Brother Stebo played out a Batlands, Mox Ruby, Mox Sapphire, into Soul Ring. Uh, he's played a Black Vice. Uh, he's also already played two Atox. So look at his hand, it's almost empty. And Juan has responded to both of those Atox with two Swords to Plowsteers. And that's why we see that Richard, AKA Brother Stebo, is on 22 at the moment. And right now it's Juan's turn. So he's playing the Swords in his own turn. And he's doing that before the Black Vice damage gets resolved. So he's casting the uh, second Swords on the Atok. And now he's going to take damage from the Vice. I believe he's got, let's take a look, he's counting his cards. Are they five cards? Let's see, it's hard to see here. And we also see both players are still kind of tweaking and tinkering. But wow, what an explosive start here for Brother Stebo. And um, there is one extra card here for Juan in hand. So that means he takes one damage. So he's going to drop to 16. It looks like he's also taking damage from probably from the Vice once. It's of course hard to tell because we kind of missed the start of the match. But we're now in turn two of game one. Uh, Juan's drawing here, finding a mountain. And he's going to cast something. And we're seeing a black vice here from Juan. I think the vices are probably not going to play a very big role in this matchup. Both players are playing with vices. I think at least for Brother Stebo, he can feed the vices to his Atok. But of course, a vice is not as good when you're playing against aggressive decks because the hands get empty so quickly. We see it here for Juan as well. Even though, um, you know, he, he, he only has two lands so far. He only has four cards in hand. And there we see a Surrendip Afrit here by Brother Stebo. And we see the thumbs up from Juan. So that Surrendip Afrit can start doing some serious work here. And remember, Juan does play with a City in a Bottle, but only a single copy. So let's see if he can find it. Already cast uh, two Swords of Plowsiers as well. Finding a Mishra's Factory here. And tapping red and a colorless. And there we see a Brass Claw Orc. So that is pretty sweet. Or actually, I should say an Iron Claw Orc. The Brass Claw is the um, Fallen Empire ones. This is the Iron Claw Orc hitting the table. It's a 2-2 two -two for one red and one. And it cannot block any creatures with power greater than one. And there we see the attack by Brother Stebo. And that means Juan's going to drop the 13. And of course, we see Brother Stebo still in 21 from that extra life that he gained from the swords on the two Atox. Uh, probably going to swing in here with the Iron Claw Orc. 
That means Brother Stebo is going to drop to 11 here. But I think uh, Juan is more concerned, or to 19, sorry, I think Juan is more concerned finding a solution here for <laughs> the Surrenda. But instead of a solution, he's just casting another Iron Claw Orc. I, I mean, I, I, I love that you're playing with these creatures, uh, Juan, I have to say. Very, very original, interesting choice here. And Brother Stebo dropping here to 18 from his own Surrenda, attacking here. Juan's already on 10, so his life is halved. And remember, both of these players are playing with four chains and four bolts. So things can go very, very quickly as soon as you kind of are at that 10 life mark. Um, probably going to swing in here for four. He's actually going to animate his Mistress Factory. Going to try to swing in for six here. There's a quick Shatter, Summer Magic Shatter. They're beautiful, but it does mean that Brother Stabo is going to drop to 14. Next turn is going to drop to 13 because of his own Surrender. And then he can swing in and put Juan on seven. This is really a race that you kind of expect with two of these decks and there's a disenchant on the mock sapphire i think it's a good solution or a good choice i mean because it cuts off blue for brother stebo and and that's important here and he's first taking the damage then he's going in three damage juan's dropping to seven here and i mean this is going to be a close match juan can attack next turn and then uh, brother stebo is going to go to nine but i mean things are looking in favor of brother stebo at the moment and oh, we see a little glitch and there we go there we, we've got brother stebo back but the the screens are now uh turned around so we've got juan on the left brother stebo on the right but the rest is still the same we've got the similar board state um and we've got actually juan attacking here for four onto richard so that means that richard is dropping here to nine and there we see a lightning bolt and this lightning bolt can maybe be very very important here brother stebo dropping Two six, then dropping two five, ooh, and that lightning bolt changed everything. One single lightning bolt has such a big impact here on the game. Attack here from Brother Stebo, so that means Juan's gonna drop to four, but he's on five himself. There's a chain, actually on one of the orcs. That makes sense, because if he drops to one, he's gonna kill himself next turn with the surrender uh, a freed. Wow, wow, wow! What an exciting first game here. So. Juan's on four, Brother Stebo's on five. Juan can now swing in for two. That means Brother Stebo will drop to three, not to two, but to three. So there's a little mistake there, but luckily the dice of Brother Stebo is correct still. So Brother Stebo's on three, dropping to two now. And yeah, he's pointing that out right now. So he's actually on, on two life. And what is he going to do? What is he going Underground C. He has to pass turn here. He cannot attack with the Surrender because if he does, he will get killed by the Iron Claw. Wow, and this is really a game where you see the value of the Iron Claw Orcs. They've been doing great work here for Juan. And there we see a strip mine on the Underground C. And he's passing turn here. And look at that. Brother Stebo's on one life. He needs a chain or a bolt. Then he has his game because then he can attack, fly through the air, put Juan on one, and then play a bolt or a chain. What is he going to do here? You see him thinking. And oh, this is actually pretty good. Mistress Factory is a blocker, so that means he can he can attack. That's exactly what he does. Juan's gonna go to one. He's got that uh, blocker, so Juan. If he cannot deal with the factory or he doesn't have a chain or a bolt, this is game for brother Stebo. Is it? No, of course he's going to kill himself with the surrender perfreed. Oh, so all Juan has to do is pass turn here. Or can he already finish it? Can he already finish it? What does he have in hand there? <laughs> is it a bolt? No, it is a blood moon and that will do the job because blood moon turns the Mishra's factory into a basic mountain. That means the Iron Claw can swing in. And I think Iron Claw is the MVP of game one. Wow, what a first game. Fantastic. And we can see that gesture there by one because that was a very, very close first game. Uh, this is what you want to see. This is the magic you want to see with two aggro decks facing each other here. Very close, very close. Let's let these players sideboard and then we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two is about to begin here, and oh man, I just hope game number two is going to look a lot like game number one, because that was some great magic, and uh, oh man, Brother Seville was so close to the victory, and, and Juan was so close to dying, and then he just, he, he takes that one. 
Iron Claw Orc MVP, definitely. Uh, but let's take a look here. So we see um, probably it's going to be Brother Stebo being on the play again, of course, because he can choose after losing that first game. And I really wonder how both of these players have boarded in. Will we see Gloom from Bro Brother Stebo? Will we see Divine uh, Offering from Juwan? Like, what, what are the choices that these players are going to make? And it looks like Brother Stebo is contemplating, do I want to keep this hand or not? And he's actually deciding to take a mulligan here. And it's, I mean, this is the top eight. And I think that Brother Stebo also knows, okay, I've lost the first game. I really need a quality hand here uh, to win this. But it's a rough start definitely here for Brother Stebo having to take a mulligan. And that means he gets to see seven. Remember, it's a London mulligan rule. And then he needs to pick one and put it under on the bottom of his library if he wants to keep it. So he's going to keep it. He's going to start with six. And we're off here with a Batlands, a Mox Sapphire, tapping both of them. And this is a Demonic Tutor. That's a very good start here. Interesting, going for the Black Lotus, I thought maybe he would choose to go for the Ancestral Recall to pick up some extra cards. Oh, this is even better. Oh, <laughs> look at that explosive start here. Of course he can do that. Oh, man. Oh, there's a Time Twister. In case, in case you didn't recognize the card, uh, that means both players are going to shuffle everything up again and draw a fresh seven. So that's really good news for Brother Stebo because he is a Mox Sapphire ahead and he's got a full grip of cards and he's already had that, that Batlands on the battlefield. So that's pretty sweet. And uh, let's take a look while he's resleeving. There is a Hammerheim, I believe. And there was a bolt. Was that a bolt that went very quickly? But I'm seeing Brother Stebo being on 17. So I guess that was a bolt or either a chain. And that's what Juan wants to do, of course. And tapping to blue here. Time walk. Ay, 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 ay. What a great start for Brother Stebo. And bad news here for Juan, who's seeing all this blue power kind of taken over. And of course, Juan is not playing with blue power. And there we see an Atok hitting the board. Atok Summer Edition. That's why it's white bordered. And there we see a Mishra's Factory here from Juan. And we see a Bolt. Is it going to be on the Atok? Because he's probably going to sack. And that's exactly what happens. He's put the Bolt on the Atok. And in response, Brother Stebo is sacking the Mox Sapphire. So that the Atok does not die. And again, attacking now. And that means... Juan dropping just to 19 is not too bad. And there is a Mishra's Factory also on the battlefield on the side of Brother Stebo. Look at that. I mean, he's got four lands, one of them being a factory. Oh, and Juan just has to pass turn, not finding any lands. Things are looking very bad here for Juan. And this is how quickly the game can change. Oh, a Library of Alexandria, but he doesn't have... How many cards does he have in hand, Brother Stebo? I guess not seven, because he's just using it to animate... The factory, we see a bolt on the factory. And then he's feeding it, of course, to the Atog. That means three damage here for Juan. And let's see. And he just has to pass turn again. So maybe his hand is full of white, white spells. That could be the case. And the attack here by the Atog. Juan dropping here to 15. And there is a Surrendip Afrit. And there is a card from the sideboard here, the Red Elemental Blast, taking care of that Surrendip. And I mean, Juan's still in this. He's found another land. Uh, it looks like it's another Mishra's Factory. Actually, you know, he can start, he can consider trying to block the Atok. Of course, having the risk that he's going to face you know, a disenchant or shatter or whatever. I guess a shatter, that's what Brother Stebo is playing. Um, the question is, is he going to do it? On the other hand, he can just take one damage. I mean, it's only one damage. He's going to drop to 14. It's not too bad. And what Brother Stebo really needs is artifacts to feed to his Atok. But he's not finding any at the moment. And look at that. Juan is just passing turn. He's not finding... The right cards are, I think, the right man. He probably has a hand full of white spells in there. Not finding any white cards. 
And look at that. Again, he's looking at his hand like, oh man, I can't really do anything. And if Brother Stevo can now find a vice, for example, look at that. Loa is active here. And wow, things are looking really, really, really good here for, for Brother Stevo. Active Loa. And look at that ancestral recall. But there's a quick response. And oh, red elemental blast, blue elemental blast. Ay, 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 ay. And things are just going so quickly here. Two Moxen found by Brother Stebo. And I mean, Juan, this is bad news. It's good news for us because it means that we're probably going to get a game number three. On the other, other hand, things are not over yet. And I think that's a Pendlehaven. And attacking here with the one two. Although it's hard for me to see what card that land is, to be honest. If you know, let me know in the comments below. But we see an attack here from the Atog. Is he going to. Sack the Mox, he's probably going to wait. Is Juan going to activate his factories? And he's actually just going to take the damage. He's going to drop to 12 here and take turn. And finally, he finds something to cast. It was the MVP from game one, the Iron Claw Orc. I mean, you know, at least he can use it as a blocker and kind of forcing Brother Stebo to then pump his Atok up. Let's see how that works, actually. Uh, but first we see a bolt on the... No, not on the Iron Claw. So choosing just to go for the life total here. Juan dropping to 9. He's probably going to think, you know what? I'm going to attack and he has to deal with the Atok and I can kill it then. And there is, again, a Black Lotus. Look at all that land of Brother Stebo. Does he have a Fireball? And there we see a City of Brass. And tapping three here, playing a Wheel of Fortune. Interesting choice. Of course, it activates his Loa, and look at that, showing his hand. <laughs> oh, that fork. He needs double red for the fork. In a way, I understand that Brother Sebo is doing this. On the other hand, he's helping Juan back in the game here. Uh, but of course, he's got the Loa, so, and he was low on cards. I mean, I, I mean, whoa, look at this. Double Ankh of Mishra. And okay, Juan says, you know what, this is, uh, this is it, this is, <laughs> this is not, it, things will only get worse before they get better, you get this game, and I must say, Brother Stebo, very, very impressive, uh, the magic that you've shown in this game number two, man, man, oh man, I mean, that, remember that, that, that opening with the uh, Demonic Tutor on the, uh, on the Black Lotus, and then the, uh, the Time Twister, man, that was just Insane. Anyway, uh, we're getting a game three, so I'm really happy. We're going to let these players sideboard again, and we'll catch back up with them in game number three. Game number three is about to begin. We've got Juan on the play. Let's see what's going to happen here. And there is a Black Vice. That's always a good start. That's like a free extra lightning bolt here. And, um, you know, I, this is kind of also forcing Brother Stebo's hand to kind of play his hand out quickly, although... That's probably what he wants to do anyway. I mean, he's had such explosive starts in both of these games so far. So let's see what he's going to do here in game number three. Of course, we see a Mox here, Mox Jet. And interesting here, we see Demonic Tutor. Okay, because I want to say we see Mishra's Factory, and now we see Demonic Tutor. And again, a Black Lotus. Okay, is he going to do it again? Although this time, if he does, um, if he plays the Time Twister, it does mean another three damage because of that. So, so, okay, so in this case, he's choosing to play out a creature and a big one, a Surrendip, a Freed 3-4 Flyer. Oh, and there we see that single city in a bottle coming in from Juan. That's a great answer. And, um, ooh, there is just a maze of if. Brother Stebel has to pass turn here uh, after attacking with the Mishra's Factory. So that means that Juan's on 18, Brother Stebo's on 17. And I think that City in a Bottle can be quite decisive here. Although, although I mean, it's only the Surrender of Freets, I guess, that Brother Stebo cannot play. But also his City of Brasses. So, I mean, and he does seem to have some mana issues here, taking damage um, from the Black Vice, I think, or not yet. His life total seems to be on 17 still, but I think next turn he's going to be in trouble and he's not finding any more lands to play. And things are looking quite good here for Juan, although he is facing that one maze of it. So deciding to animate and attack with both. Interesting. Does that mean that he has using a maze on probably 
on the lion exactly and taking two damage from the mistress factory deciding not to animate his own mistress factory probably worried about a um swords to plowshares of course that's what i'm trying to say here and there we see a bolt okay i guess it was a bolt and uh wow look at that brother stebo's already on 10 and this is the decisive decisive game here and it looks like things are not really working out for Brother Stebble here in Game 3, even after that really good start with the Black Lotus and Turn 1 Surrender Perfreet. Dropping to four measly life here, facing three Black Vices. And I, I, to be honest, I can't believe that I said in the introduction, I was it Game 1 where I said, I don't think Black Vices are going to be really, are going to play a really big role here. And look at that, it's already done, it's already over. It's over before you before you realize that we've even started. And wow, what what a game three. This went so quickly and there, I mean, this is what can happen as well. I mean, Brother Stebo just couldn't find red mana. Um, he had to face the city in a bottle. There was constant pressure. There were more and more vices being built up by Juan. And everything I said about the vices not being important in this matchup because there are two aggro decks, I take everything absolutely back. I was not right. and. Game three really, really proves that. Um, anyway, this was the top eight match. Let's check out the winning deck here of Juan. Really cool, really like those Iron Claw orcs in the deck. Uh, and I guess we're going to see Juan later in the tournament. Um, this was it for now. And next week, Friday, we have another match from the Raging Bull series, and that will be the semi finals. Um, so if you want to follow everything about this tournament, be sure to tune in next week because then we have the update. We have the next match of the semifinals of the Raging Bull series. How exciting. And if you want to support the channel, if you want to show your support, you can do so by liking this video, leaving a comment, uh, sharing this on your socials and subscribe. If you're not a subscriber yet, it's really appreciated. You can also become a sponsor of the show. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can become a patron. There's probably a card popping up right now click on that card that will take you to timmy talks patreon page and you can read all about it talking about the patrons let's go to the end scroll and let's see the fantastic amazing wonderful patrons of timmy talks Ik het als fikkertjes somber gezien.